All right. Well, let's get rolling. It's 11 o'clock. I want to be respectful for your time, Pat, and um, for our, for those on the call. Um, first and foremost, I'm, I'm super excited. This is our final uh, LEARN webinar that uh, we've started here in 2022 and uh, excited to wrap this year up with Pat Jones. Uh, I'm excited to have you today, Pat. I know it's been a busy week for you. And uh, on behalf of WS Conley, uh, our companies with 10 Barge, Walker Supply, and Landscape Supply, I want to thank you and everybody in attendance today for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to be here with us today. Um, again, at the end of this, this will be the final webinar of a series that we started back in September. Uh, we have uh, GCSAA CEU points that will, will be available to uh, everyone. And... Uh, and then we're going to start a 2023 schedule. We've already got January up, and I think Pat Pat will kind of share that with you uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Pat. Uh, Pat's been a longtime friend for the, for the golf industry, specifically uh, to us at WS Conley over the years. Uh, Pat and I have known each other for a long time, so it was great seeing you this week up here at the New Jersey Turf Expo. Uh, excited about today's presentation. Uh, You've been a, a steward uh, of our superintendents and, and this industry for over 30 years and certainly appreciate all the publicity that you provide and uh, content that you provide on Twitter for sure is enjoyable. So without further ado, I want to don't want to take any time, but you're going to present managing through some of these challenging times that we're we're faced with today and uh, look forward to we'll hear what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rick. You're very kind. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have very much enjoyed the last few days here at the at the New Jersey Turf Expo, and it, it gave me some some um, uh, confidence boost that there are still healthy, uh, um, well managed shows out there that are are doing what they're supposed to do, which is to create relationships between superintendents and and industry and and uh, and the next generation. Uh, who are coming up through Rutgers, but also to continue to fund these things that, that don't fund themselves, lobbying and education and all the things that we want to do as, a, as a, an industry, we need those associations. So it's great to see a group like New Jersey doing so well. And I, I heard good things about OTF too. So hopefully that's a, that's a reverberating throughout the industry. So, okay. So you signed up for this crazy thing. Um, here's what you're going to get. <laughs> today. So, so we're, we're kind of talking, I'm trying to put a little bit of the state of the industry in perspective. And I, I think you guys know, I do, I'm, I'm kind of the state of the industry guy by default over the years. So I'm going to talk about what happened from my perspective and, and kind of where we are now, how things have changed, um, not just post pandemic, but some trends that were already going on. And, and then kind of what's coming up next, what are the th some things I think that we all need to be on the lookout for. And then just let's talk a little bit about management. Let's talk a little bit about management style and some things you can do to, to set yourself apart uh, as a leader, but also to make sure that you, your people understand and, and appreciate each other and you. So uh, it's a little kind of soft skills management discussion today, um, as opposed to cracking the whip management, a little different. So anyway, um, as, as Eric said, and mentioned, I've had a long relationship with the with the uh, landscape supply folks in the Connolly family, just from uh, being involved in independent distribution over the years and being such a believer in family run companies in this industry. They're so important. They're so good. Uh, and now, and now, so I will, so uh, the Connollys are, are are great friends to this industry, right? And so now they've joined forces with with Chad Will, my buddy from Ten Barge. And and Walker and Windsheim, uh, Windsheimer uh, uh, as well. So pretty cool, pretty cool to have a bunch of my friends working together to uh, hopefully successfully meet your needs. And I just think it's a neat story that all of these family family run companies are are sort of banding together and and acting big. And I, I think we all benefit when that happens. So thanks again, boys, for inviting me. And and I'm always happy to be a part of the team. So uh, just catch you up. People have been asking, what the hell are you doing, Pat? What's going on? What's your job these days? So, so here's a little picture of me handing off the megaphone uh, to Guy Cipriano, who succeeded me uh, in running the editorial uh, and, and, and operations of uh, Golf Course Industry Magazine. This was in April of 2019, so three years ago. And so I left that uh, thinking I was going to go to work for another big distributor. 
Ooh, that didn't work out well. <laughs> so, so I did what I'd originally planned to do, which was to leave the publishing business and kind of start my own thing. So now I, I do consulting and content work with big companies in the industry. You probably see stuff I do for Aquatrols and BASF. I do work for Baron Brug and, and a few other companies, but I'm really fortunate to have made this transition to kind of running my own business and, uh, I, I, I honestly, the biggest challenge I have right now is finding some ways to give back. I, I'd like to spend some time volunteering and doing things like that. Uh, but but I, I, I cannot complain about my life. Uh, I'm 60 years old. I have two grandchildren that I adore. Uh, I, I will tell you right now, if you haven't reached this point in your life, uh, grandchildren and our grandparenting is way better than parenting. It's so much more fun and so much more uh, rewarding. Because parenting sucks. You know, <laughs> there's way too much accountability and everything else. But grandparenting, grandparenting is really great. So we're really enjoying that. And again, the the, the business part of it is so much fun. And um, I'd love to tell you about the couple of trips I've been on recently in England and, and courses up in Long Island and Connecticut, but we just don't have enough time. So uh, catch me later on that. So so let's look a little back. Let's look, look back pre-pandemic and kind of look at where we're at in 2019. And, and put this in perspective. Let me move this thing here. Um, so at the time, supply was about 15,000 and it was slowly shrinking. It was like this balloon that just shrunk a little bit every year, about 1%, right? It got smaller and smaller. And it had been doing that for years and rounds were basically flattish. And everybody was kind of like, okay, well, we're doing renovations. And the, the, the a constant theme that I've harped on is the haves and the have nots. The haves were investing and, and doing the right things to take their clubs in the future. And the have nots were sort of getting left behind. And uh, because business was flat and costs were higher, they just weren't making any money. So profitability among American golf clubs was at 60 ish percent or something like that, break even or profitable. And uh, boy, has that changed. So that's where we were. And labor was, was obviously a bear already. And the big complaint was there's no four year degree kids anymore. Uh, now we got bigger problems than that. Um, the effective minimum wage was about 1150, which was still low. You know, it, it, it was it was low compared to construction, compared to landscaping and everything else. But it had just always been the culture of the industry. Oh, yeah, we pay minimum wage. OK. Um, and the national budget, the average budget, including water, but not including labor or excuse me, inclu including labor and water, but not including capital was about eight hundred thousand. Right. So and, and mostly what we were seeing was. Some of the boomers, like Matt Schaefer here, who a lot of you are, I'm sure know, and he's standing with a guy named Armin Suni, another boomer who made a big difference and continues to be the leading recruiter in the industry. So I put those two together because I, uh, Matt was kind of, he was kind of uh, the, the first domino that fell in the boomers retiring. When he left Marion and then Latshaw came up and succeeded him and then Zimmer's left Oakmont and blah, blah, and Chad Will left there and went to blah, blah, blah. It just started this whole, this whole uh, dominoes falling thing. So I look at Matt, as always, as being a leader in this kind of stuff. So, so but, but he, was the, he was just one of many uh, uh, that came, uh, came to age in the 70s and the 80s uh, and, and helped to build the golf industry and build the profession into what it was. Uh, with four-year degrees from Penn State or Rutgers or Michigan State or Virginia Tech or wherever. So, you know, the, the boomers were beginning to retire. And, and it was thought that, well, great, some of these some of these younger folks that have been sitting and waiting patiently are finally going to get an option. So, flash forward three years. So, <laughs> the supply shrinkage has actually slowed down even more. I mean, it wasn't that big to begin with. But now it's kind of basically flat. And, and, and believe it or not, and this sounds crazy, we're actually building some new courses that aren't just destination courses like Stream Song or Sand Valley or Band and Dunes. These are courses that are attached to real estate, real estate developments or communities feel like they need one all of a sudden, which if you told me that a couple of years ago, I would have, I would have checked your pulse. So anyway, that's shrinking now. And, and in fact, profitability is in the 80th percentile. They were self-reported profitability by golf clubs, about 84% say they're profitable or break even these days. It's amazing. That's a huge difference, right? And it's all cash flow. It's all the pandemic bubble cash flow. So uh, labor is even worse. Uh, Four-year degrees have trickled down to nothing. Uh, there's only a couple hundred uh, turf grads a year coming into the market versus about a thousand 
in the early 2000s, 20 years ago, when, when, hey, send more, send more. And then when the recession hit, we said, oh, stop sending, stop sending kids. And a lot of those programs ceased to exist. They just stopped. So it, labor is, is terrible and looking for free qualified labor with degrees is even harder. Uh, um, a month ago or so, I went over to State College PA for the Penn, or the Penn, the Penn State uh, uh, job fair. They, did a, they held a job fair for their kids. And there's 50 or 60 kids total in the Penn State turf program at different levels and two and four year. And that room was full of people who wanted to hire them, including, and I'm, I'm just guessing here, probably 25 directors of agronomy or, or uh, uh, superintendents from top 100 clubs. The best, Del Sandro. I mean, all sorts of important people there looking to just grab a couple of those kids as interns. <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's how valued they are and how important it is. So that's getting worse. And I think it, it, it's just going to require us to change the way we think about labor because I don't know that all of us are going to be able to solve our problem by being better recruiters, okay? Some of you will, but not all of you. The minimum wage is at least $15. You know, I talked to, to Tyler Bloom, our friend from the, the, way, the labor uh, analysis and solutions industry, and Tyler says 15 plus, plus, plus. Um, and that's not just California, that's everywhere. So get used to it. Um, this is, is unquestionably, on the upside, the greatest job market for everyone in the industry, except for the boomers and the other folks sort of at the tail end of their career. If you're an aspiring golf course superintendent, you're talented, uh, the sky is the limit. If you're one of these students and you have some ambition and you have even the least ability to network, you, the sky is the limit. And if you're a 30 something to 45 something super and you've really proved yourself, you can be one of those top 200 supers making $300,000 a year right now, under 100%. Under 100%. So uh, there are the scout uh, salaries have, I don't say skyrocketed is the right word, but they were they were already going up a little bit, and now they've really gone up because people want to keep the talent they have, or go recruit a new talent for. We're going to take it. We're going to take it in a new direction. You know, when when that time comes and the club decides to make a change. So uh, this is it. This is as good as it's ever going to be. If you're if you're aspiring and you can move and you uh, have that opportunity, this there's never been a better time. Um, and and if you're underpaid ask for more. <laughs> I'm telling you, ask for more because there's too much demand for you to settle for uh, crappy pay and a crappy job. So uh, here's the great news, right? So I hate bubbles. I hate golf bubbles. I, I've been through booms. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I hate golf booms. I've been through several of them and they always bust. They suck, right? But the COVID bubble is different. The COVID bubble came and it delivered all this instant, you know, cash and blah, blah, blah. And then, but unlike other bubbles, it didn't burst all the way. It's going to slow down some, but because of work from home, because of this new trend in American life, um, we believe, I believe, 15 to 20% of the COVID rounds that we saw, that growth, that amazing bubble, uh, are here to stay for sure. And they, and they tend to be the people who are our best customers, right? So I have a good friend. He's the husband of my wife's business partner. He's a, an uber successful lawyer in, uh, in Cleveland. And he plays a lot of golf at Shaker Heights Country Club when he can. And before pandemic, that meant once a week, maybe, you know, and he'd do the golf trip occasionally, you know, once a year or whatever, he'd go up to Whistling Straits or Bandon or whatever. Just one of those guys with resources who could do it, but all he lacked was time. And when, pan when the pandemic came along, he was like, I don't think I can work at home. I don't know what I, I don't know how I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And two weeks later, he was like, I can play golf every day. <laughs> so, so he went from playing once a week to three or four times a week. And, and I think he's just, I think there's millions of, of Bill Weirs out there that are, they're able to do that. So uh, the pandemic has untethered people from their office and that's a win for golf. The office was always the enemy of the golf course. Now it's not anymore. So that's a big win. And the other thing is um, uh, families, children, particularly young girls, uh, I, I think, uh, embracing the game. And, and there couldn't be anything better than that. By the way, the first green program that the GCSA sponsors is probably the best program in the industry. Uh, it's, it's got such potential in so many ways. So I urge you to look into that. And if your chapter isn't already doing something with it, to get involved. 
Okay. So one of the big trends right now, obviously the, the, the shortage, right? So either you can get creative and really find ways to recruit a lot of people and, and students and retirees and ex-military and all these things we hear about, or you can begin to think long-term, how can we run this place with the Marine Corps, right? We used to, we're always the army. We are always a big group. We got an army out there maintaining the golf course. How can we create a Marine Corps, a smaller, better trained, more sophisticated force to manage your golf course, right? And I don't know. I don't have that answer for you, right? But it's going to involve paying as much or more to a smaller group, loyalty and strategy, loyalty strategy to keep them all there for as long as you can keep them there, and, and a real commitment. To, to being able to communicate with your, your ownership when you're going to need some outside help, when you're going to need a little bit of short-term help to get through things, but otherwise being committed to running your operation with probably 50% of what would have been ideal in the past. So I, it, it, it's just one of those things. So every club is going to have to come up with its own strategy to, to figure out the labor thing. But I think one commonality is figuring out how to keep good people in a smaller staff. Um, we are seeing now, I hate it when I'm right all the time, but I predicted that the, the, the short-term cash flow that kept some of these golf courses alive longer would be interrupted by the fact that that is the only, uh, oftentimes these golf courses that are cash flow courses, family operations, are kind of out on the edge of the city someplace, are the only developable land in the area, right? So you're already seeing now, there was just an article in Forbes the other day about Raleigh. And, and courses that are semi-successful, I mean, they're not going broke, they're okay courses that are, are, are selling to realtors now and, and being developed into homes and condos and mixed-use developments and stuff like that. So the fact of the matter is that 150 acres of land is way more valuable to a realtor or developer, excuse me, than it is to uh, a golf course operator. And, and you, golf, is, golf can be a great business, right? But oftentimes, as we've seen, it's just kind of a break-even thing year after year. You do what you can. People love the club, blah, blah, blah. But when the time comes and somebody offers you $12 million for that land, what are you going to do? <laughs> so, so we're beginning to see that. And I think we'll see that kind of shrink the supply of golf courses from 14500 or wherever it is right now down to 13000 ish eventually, maybe 10 years from now, right? So shrink it a little bit faster because we're buying these up to do something else with them and get supply and demand more equal. So it's painful, but it's healthy in the long run. Uh, the big regulatory thing is not necessarily pesticides or anything like that. It's, there's some concern about that, but nothing, nothing like Europe where they're wide, widely banning aesthetic use of pesticides. So what is an issue here, though, uh, regulatorily is taxation. So more and more communities and covid accelerated this, are looking around going, we need to make sure we're taxing everybody, right? We need some money here. And, and one of the, you know, the things has been, these golf clubs, they seem to be okay. And we, we, we're okay with having them, but they don't pay any taxes. And that just doesn't seem right. Aren't they kind of businesses? So private clubs, uh, I, I think, are in the sights of regulators a little bit more for taxation thing. And then the other thing, and this is probably not a huge deal, considering we're mostly talking about the mid-Atlantic here, is the cost of water, right? So you've got, you always had water be an issue in golf and, and, and the, the cost of water um, was vastly different from, from operation to operation. People had their own wells or they had some sort of their own source versus people who had to buy a little bit from the city or buy some from another source versus people who were paying for effluent water because the city was charging them for the, the pleasure of disposing it or People who, who you know, the Southern California golf market or the desert golf market, where it's a million gallons a day. It's a million gallons a day, and their water budget's an enormous part of, of whether or not they can break even as a golf course. So uh, I have a friend in California. He's another distributor. He's good friends with, with uh, lots of folks in the industry, and he bought a golf course just because he wanted to, right? He's, so he he's a, owns a distributorship sells stuff to superintendents, but he decided he wanted to be a superintendent too. So he bought a golf course. And I, I asked him not too long, I was like, how's it going? And he says, we lose $700,000 a year because of water. <laughs> that's how expensive water is in California, right? So that's the kind of stuff that's going to impact us 
uh, I think more so than probably any looming chemical uh, restrictions. So uh, the other thing you're seeing is a nice trend, and this picture is a great example of it, of people walking and treating golf as exercise and, and something you do with your kids. Um, I, I hate golf carts personally. I love the fact that they helped me pay for advertising for years and years in my magazines, but if I have a chance to skip it, I will. Um, up to and including walking, get ready for this. 14 miles at Royal Liverpool, Hoy Lake, uh, when I was over there <laughs> not too long ago. Yeah, how bad do I have to be to walk 14 miles and, and 18 holes of golf? But it was it was something. The wind was blowing 35 miles an hour. But but it was great exercise. I felt great later. I felt like I got my steps in. But anyway, more people are doing that. And I think it's something that it'll be interesting to track how golf car usage changes over the next five years and see if this continues and that fewer people are interested in riding and more people want to walk. Uh, uh, robots are coming, automation's gonna come. You know, it, it, it's, there's all sorts of little details that need to be worked out, but, but if you have a chance to mow fairways with something besides a human being, it's gonna pay for itself and it just will. So uh, that's gonna be something happening. The automated ball pickers are cool. Um, so I think we're going to see more of this. I, any of you in the sports field market, the, uh, the robot painters are awesome. The line painters really work well. So, but overall, big trends, you see these clubs investing in the future. They're doing renovations. They're hiring people. They're trying to build up, you know, the team for the next 25 years. And we're going to invest in the course. So we're going to invest in people. So that's a big deal. Uh, I talked about the career market. It just doesn't get any better. Um, and then a little bit of to my comment earlier about, about the New Jersey show where Eric and I are right now, it, it, it's a good one. It's a healthy one. But in so many cases, these trade shows, and, and, and to some extent, you have to include GCSA in this, these trade shows are terrible ways to raise money for a good cause, right? So, it, it, you know, in the short version is, yeah, the GCSA trade show makes $5 million a year or like $2 million or whatever, but it makes vastly more money in cities people don't want to go, like San Antonio. It doesn't make a lot of money in San Diego or Orlando. So there's this, what do you do? How do you fix all that, right? So it, it, it's a real challenge for, uh, for these trade shows to make this work. And, and so and when they're not particularly well promoted or, or well organized, or they're just kind of doing the same thing they've always done, it really doesn't work. So I think the industry does need to look at a, a change in the way we do funding and, and, and be honest about it. You know, do, do we really need to have these shows to see products we already know and, and people we already know, or can we just do some networking and education events and not have to do all this other stuff? If companies will, can, you know, I, I think I think if you ask the average turf company, hey, uh, would you like to come to our show for two days and spend thirty thousand dollars exhibiting, or would or would you just cut us a check for ten grand, which is twice as much as we'll make off of your thirty thousand dollars, and we'll figure out something else to do? The companies would take the check every time. They, they, they trade shows are enormously expensive and enormously disruptive. And yes, you get nice, uh, you get nice relationship building out of it and everything else. But the golf, there's 14,500 golf courses. We know who runs them. We know how to reach you guys. There's lots of ways to sell you things without dragging your ass to a trade show. So there you go. So this is going to continue. Uh, one of the things that worries me, I hear a lot, are so many superintendents who feel like they are not reaching their potential because they're back out on the golf course, but you don't have enough people. So you're back out there instead of, of running your operation and leading and doing the right things uh, personally and professionally, you're out there with a hose or you're out there with your head in the hole trying to fix an irrigation problem. And that worries me. That's it's, it's a problem. And I just think it's one more thing that needs to be included in this Marine Corps kind of philosophy. Um, a lot of superintendents I know, particularly the boomer folks that are kind of being retired, right? Some people are retiring. Some people are retiring, right? So the, the moving into a sales career is not as easy as it used to be yeah, because there's, there's good, talented people there in front of you, right? And the old thing is, well, I'll just sell to all my friends. Well, <laughs> all of your friends are friends of those other people who are kind of in front of you in line. So it, it, it's tough thing. So uh, and there's all sorts of different roles you can have. You can be a DSR, you can be a, a national salesperson, or increasingly, and this is interesting, you can be an outsourced person. 
Uh, I know several people who've left regular employment in the industry recently, either voluntarily or otherwise, who are putting themselves out as outsourced people. I will come in and fix all your small irrigation problems over the course of a week and it will cost you X, right? That seems like a pretty good idea. Um, I, we've seen this with uh, mechanics for a long time, but now we're seeing it with agronomy, um, spray people that do sprays for you, things like that. So that's another thing. This is already happening in the in the front of house uh, for a long time with, uh, with uh, restaurant operations, kitchen stuff, HR. Clubs have been outsourcing stuff for a long time and more so the last few years because it's so hard for the front of house to find people. Um, that it's only natural to see this developing as a, as a new option uh, for golf course superintendents. I can't do, I don't have the time or the people to go around and fix all these heads that are screwed up. I'm going to get somebody else to do it, right? So it, it, it's, it's using money to solve a, a short-term problem. And so it's a good thing to think about and maybe budget for. Um, I, I do think you're going to see more of these, these sort of apprenticeship programs uh, around the area. I know uh, Tyler Bloom set up one in Maryland, and I, I know that there are some other ones out there. But I think, I think we, uh, we need to find more ways to develop our own talent, right? Either within the staff, right, and within your current staff to kind of identify, nurture, and develop people who seem to have a, a, an aptitude for, for, for turf, uh, and then send them to Rutgers or send them to Ohio State's two-year program or Penn State's two-year program or whatever and, and get them the, the agronomic training they need. And you've just hopefully built a great, uh, a great future professional and maybe an employee at your place for a long time to come. So I, I think that that's something you're going to see more of is the harvesting good, talented young people out of crews, but also doing a much better job at recruiting people generally to the industry and, and and why people would want to come work. And, you know, the, the classic thing I found is if, if you're around people and they're potentially somebody you'd want to recruit, say, do you like working outdoors? And you start that conversation about outdoors and you'll find who you want. You'll find the hunters and the fisher, the fisher people and the, and the people who just love uh, green spaces pretty quickly. Do you love working outdoors? So, and you'll also find people who are dying because they're stuck in an office someplace. I've interviewed a million golf course superintendents who got into the business because they were stuck in an office and they just couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand being inside all day. So that's always a good opening line. Um, I have to talk about Top Golf because the National Golf Foundation now counts Top Golf and all this other crap <laughs> as golf. And it it's not. Top Golf is a bowling alley. Uh, I, I've challenged them from day one to produce some information that that proves that people who start at Top Golf actually go on and play real green gas golf and buy golf clubs and uh, you become members at clubs eventually, and they can't prove it. <laughs> so because it's not real, it didn't happen. So anyway, Top Golf is eh, it's a nice thing. It's fun. I like going to it, but do not tell me it's golf because it's not. It's bowling. Um, <laughs> and, and the bigger thing, and this sounds bad, but I think it's just important to understand. This disparity between the haves and the have-nots in the industry, and it's probably every industry is like this, right? Every every profession is like this, where some people have better jobs and better resources, and some people don't. But I think in golf, this is this is the case that the the ability to attract and retain play with quality conditions and quality design is is vastly more important than it used to be. And the other thing is the baby boomers who we've relied on to play in all these senior leagues and all this stuff are dying. So uh, it, it's going to change. It's going to flop. So the, this whole culture of we do $17 rounds for mostly for older guys and blah, blah, blah has got to change. You've got to figure out a way to either change your, your, your customer base or change your business model because your customer base is literally dying. Right. So, so as we move forward, Will others replace them or will you see other forms of retirement uh, where guys just play golf all day like they do now? I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's something you have to come to grips with. But again, the have nots are kind of sitting around going, well, yeah, we've got our leagues and we got our, you know, the guys play, and, you know, they bitch when we raise a cup of coffee a quarter, blah, blah, blah. And no, <laughs> no. If you're working at one of those places, go get a different job. Um, okay. So. This is the one I think everyone will talk about, and then we'll talk a little bit about managing. 
but but this is what I bumped into a lot lately as as there's some disruption in the industry and people are changing jobs and people are getting asked to move on uh, or whatever else. Anytime, anytime there's sort of disruption, it always reminds me about this thing about identity. Right. And I, and I think that the, the culture, the superintendent culture is a wonderful, wonderful thing because it's such a clear cut identity. We're, we're a band of brothers and sisters. Uh, we are we're all in it together. We support each other. Even if our clubs compete like crazy against each other, we help each other out. We share information. We we loan. We will come help somebody if they've had a disaster. All that stuff. Right. It is a band of friends and colleagues and comrades. And it's always been like that. So <laughs> the day you lose that job and you're no longer that, you're no longer superintendent, it's an identity crisis. It's really hard. And I had this, I had the same feeling, honestly, when I, I chose to leave GCI, but I, I suddenly wasn't, I'm Pat Jones, publisher of Golf Course Industry Magazine. I wasn't that anymore. I was, well, I'm a consultant and I do content and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's hard, it's hard to explain. So it, it, it's, it's an important thing to understand that at some point that's going to happen to you. And if you are overly attached to this identity and you don't have other things that you treasure in your life and that you don't have um, things to, to take you away from the, the anxiety of all this stuff, you might have problems adjusting. It's tough. So uh, you know, just over the years, I've seen this time and time again where people you know, they leave to go into sales or whatever else, and it takes some adjustment. So be advised, that's part of the thing, but also be advised, maybe try not to get so wrapped up in the I'm a superintendent thing. And I don't know what else to tell you about that, but, but it is hard eh, because you go from this, such a defined, cool, self-supporting culture to being, hey, I uh, work for a, a nursery firm, <laughs> you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's different. So um, lots and lots and lots of talk, particularly as the pressure was on with fewer people during the pandemic about stress, anxiety, et cetera, depression. Um, I, I think most of you know I've gone through this stuff. Uh, I quit drinking 12 years ago because it was uh, because it was stupid and I was just trying to self-medicate for depression. I was depressed because my life wasn't turning out the way I thought it was going to. I don't know. Lots of reasons, right? So uh, so I drank and I, I, I made stupid decisions because of that. Um, alcohol fuels uh, idiocy. So anyway, it, but it was a lot of it was trying to was trying to cope with this this anxiety I felt, and, and I I think sometimes it borders it feels like paranoia, right? Because you begin to fear something that's not even real. You know, you make up stuff in your mind. Um, superintendents overthink stuff. Guys overthink stuff in, in general. But superintendents I think I think tend to really overthink things, and that causes anxiety because you're like the what if, the what if, the kind of death spiral of. Well, what if they don't like this? And then uh, I, I get, I'm going to be in trouble with my main supporter on the board and then blah, blah, blah. And I get fired and I end up in the gutter. You know, that, that sort of dust spiral thing. And, and I, think that, I think that everybody has to recognize that that's a real feeling. But so many times it's not a real thing. That's not going to happen. You know, it, it, it's, you're not going to get fired over some small thing most of the time. But we, we get conditioned to worry about everything because we, we want to make sure everything's locked and okay and, and all that stuff. And, and, it, and it does. It weighs on you. It weighs on you. And, and then the depression part of it is a little more calculated. It's a little more, it's a little more, that's a little more physiological. So depression is really kind of a disease. So, you, you know, you have this, this, this anxiety coping with stuff. And, and part of that is then fueled by depression. And then, you know, if you did like me, you self-medicate. So um, here's the answer. Go talk to somebody. You know, if you really feel like that and you have this kind of uh, anxiety, uh, 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 death spiral thing in your head, go talk to somebody, anybody, right? Um, if you feel like you're overusing anything, go to an AA meeting. And, and everybody, oh, would somebody recognize me? Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. There's plenty of drunks there. They don't care who you are. Right. So uh, but they'll help you they'll, the, the, and they'll, they'll show you that there are people out there getting sober uh, very successfully. So so I, I just think that that it seems very topical right now. Lots of people I talked to said, yeah, it's a stressful year and I probably took the bottle a little too hard. So uh, so think about that and think about what you can do to make sure you're healthy and you're serving your family and your, your employees and your friends well. 
Um, so, and just, just a couple of other simple things you can do. We, we talk a lot. There's, a, there's a Paul McCormick, the mindful superintendent. It's an awesome, awesome human being, but there's a lot to, there's a lot to digest there. But fundamentally, mindfulness for me has always been a little kind of a meditation thing. And it's as simple as this. It's called box breathing, or you can call it anything you want. But if you feel like things are out of control, stop, close your eyes, inhale and hold it for four seconds. Exhale and hold that for four seconds and just do that and just focus on your breath and, and try to try to bring yourself back to normalcy. So just a small thing you can do when you feel like you're panicky, right? Uh, it's not going to stop a panic attack probably, but it, but it can help, right? All right, that's enough of that. So just talk about leading and managing here a little bit as we, as we finish up. So if you want to if you want to be a better leader and manager. Yes, you, you got to have the the right, you know, uh, motivation. You got to hire the right people. You got to have the right plan. You got to have good assignment boards. Uh, you got to have some long term thinking. You know, okay, I got a plan ahead. I mean, we're going to renovate six of our bunkers every year for the next five years. Whatever. You you've got to be that person that, that manages. But you've also got to be a person who sort of leads and 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 create something bigger it's it's kind of like your ability to do force projection you're only so good as a manager but you can be really good as a leader if you do some of these things and, and i could have picked any one of a, a dozen things but I, I wanted to focus on three things today so number one is how good a communicator are you right and this is i think a shortfall for for many of us and that's all i've ever had all i've ever had is the the ability my mom an english teacher gave me to put words together in some coherent form okay i can't grow grass for shit <laughs> but 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 i can do that and, and so there's there are times when that weird skill is very very important for you so a couple of things um think about how you tell stories about your golf course right so who are you telling them to and how are you telling them? Um, this has been where Twitter has been so important, but increasingly uh, Instagram is filling that void and a little bit TikTok, believe it or not. I'm not quite sure how TikTok's going to work as an education thing yet, but, but make sure that you're sharing stuff on platforms where your target audience is going to be. And Twitter is a great target audience to reach other superintendents. It's a crappy target audience to reach your members or your customers or your bosses. So the, the, the biggest thing I've seen that's been, uh, been a, a win for superintendents is not necessarily which platform they're on, Twitter or, or Instagram or whatever, but they're creating YouTube style videos to tell their story, right? So, it, it, and it's not complicated. You all have this, right? Here's your YouTube storytelling uh, thing right here. And, and, and you just film a short video saying, this is the proper way to fix ball marks here at the club right? Or this is, this is why we ask you to not walk on frosted greens. You know, the, the, the little problematic things we have, and you just share it with them and say, you know, this is how we do it. And that works quite well at a, at a private club. But it works pretty well too at, at a public facility where you've got some places to play those videos and show people. But the, but the point is, is it puts you in a position of, of being authoritative and showing them, here's why we do things. Now, if you do this right, you're also telling at a private club, for example, you're telling your members, here's why we're taking down the trees on 16 and 17, or here's what you can expect from the new bunkers, managing expectations, right? Just little short three to four minute videos. And then you email them on the, on the club list, right? You send them out to the club list or you send them to the people who think you need to see it. Um, and you're sharing that information. Club members are not going to join Twitter. Okay, There's a, it's a terrible, terrible way to try to reach your club members. But they will they will open up an email with it and look at a YouTube video from you because you're the turf expert. So uh, I like that as much as anything I've seen recently are superintendents. And you don't have to be great at it. It can kind of be. It can kind of be just. It doesn't have to be overproduced. You don't have to put a bunch of graphics on there. If you've got a kid on your team or a child of your own at home who's a good uh, video editor, sure, you can play with some of that stuff, but keep it really simple. Think, okay, what are the five things I want to tell my members this year? And then make a little video about each of them. And again, they only have to be a couple of three minutes. Um, 
and, and just keep it real straightforward. If you want to have some fun, bring somebody else on there with you. Bring the golf pro on there. Tony, tell us about why it's important for golfers to to fix their ball marks. You know, so have, have Tony do it and say, well, let me show you how, Tony. Right. Whatever it might be, just think creatively and, and think about ways you can deliver it that are not Twitter. Right. So uh, I really do like this emailing stuff to members. I, I think I think so many clubs don't really have good e-newsletters. If you do use that. Great. But if you but if they don't just get access to the email list or figure out a way that you can you can find the emails of your key members and communicate with them, because, you know, 90 percent of the decisions are made by 10 percent of the people in your, your facility. So that's thing number one is think about new ways to communicate and think about video. Make yourself a little video star, right? And trust me, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> it just not, I'm not, I'm a boomer. And if I can edit a little video, I, I, I think you can too. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, and this is just a philosophical thing. And I get, I, I get caught up in this too. Don't hate on customers so much. You know, we all do this where where it's like, can you believe this guy and the pattern he left on my my practice tee? And he obviously isn't a professional because he didn't make a perfect straight line pattern. Who cares? <laughs> okay, who cares? They're the customers, right? It's up to you to educate them, by the way, right? It's not up to you to berate them. It's up to you to put a sign out of the tee that says, here's our preferred divot pattern. Try to do this, okay? Light a candle rather than curse the customer. But uh, the other thing is you know, unrepaired ball marks and stuff like that. You know, again, teach them how to do it. Don't just bitch about it. Um, people who drive too close to the to the greens. Ah, that guy, he's in a, here's a picture of an idiot. He's parked next to a green. It happens. We all know this, but it's up to us to change it through education. Don't sit around waiting for GCSA or the USGA or anybody to get their message through. Take ownership of the problem and educate them yourself. Find a way to get them information. <laughs> I've been... I, some of you are old and you probably listened to me give some version of this talk for 30 years. 30 years ago, I was talking about the fact that if you want to communicate to your male members, put the information in the urinal eye high above them, right? Or on the back of the door in the ladies room, the, the stall. <laughs> it still works. It's, it's, you know, we're, here we are in the age of TikTok and stuff like that still works. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Um, I, I have been, I've been shocked at how little information I find in carts these days. It used to be that it'd be more like, here's five tips from the club about, you know, being a good, uh, caretaker of the course, fix your ball marks, rake your bunker, repair your divots, blah, blah, blah. I, I think those are still just as good as they've ever been. But more importantly, I, I'm not so sure it's healthy for us to bash our customers on social media quite as much as we do. Um, I'm also concerned sometimes, even though I laugh, when you see the mower tipped over in the lake picture, um, I strongly don't think you should put the, here's the pile of stuff I got from early order picture out there. That's probably not a message you want to send to uh, the public at large on Twitter or another uh, format like that. We all know it's perfectly normal and, and safe and, and, and all EPA approved, but they do not. It looks like a big pile of uh, poison. You know? So be, care be advised about that kind of stuff. But but, you know, I was talking to uh, Chad Mark about this from Muirfield. And Chad, I, I think you don't, you don't find better superintendents or people with better character than Chad. And he's just like, yeah, it really troubles me that we treat our customers. We talk about our customers like that because they are, they are the people who pay the bills. They are our members. They are our friends in many cases. And berating them makes us look small. I, th I think there's something to that. So last but not least, uh, in terms of management strategies as we move forward in the future is um, empathy. And this, I hear this a lot and I, 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 it takes me back. Uh, well, I heard it the other day. I heard it the other day and I, I went to Yale Golf Course to visit Jeff Austin, uh, who is a friend of mine who took over Yale and is, is in the process of getting ready to work with Gil Hans and do a major redo of an unbelievable cool golf course. And, and I... I was talking to him and he has a non-traditional workforce. He has a union workforce because they're connected to Yale. And so he has a real challenge in front of him, figuring out how am I going to build relationships? He's been there a year and a half now, I think. How am I going to build relationships with these people? And how am I going to get them to act as a team and all that stuff? Because unions are unions, right? And, and I said, well, what do you think? And he says, empathy. I'm going to get to know them. I'm going to find out who they are as people. And I'm going to try to figure out how he and that person and I can work together to be successful. And that all comes down to empathy. It comes down to looking in somebody else's eye 
and understanding their point of view, walking in their shoes and understanding their 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 journey. And uh, if you want to read an article about this that I think summarizes it much better than I ever could, uh, go back and, and uh, use the Google machine and Google Dean Graves, golf course industry, turf heads issue. Uh, Dean wrote an article for us five or six or seven years, however long it's been that they've been doing the turf as issue that I invented. Um, uh, so, so, but we asked Dean to do it one year and he wrote this article about what he'd learned about managing people over three decades at Chevy Chase Country Club. And it really came down to, to empathy and getting to know people and, and treating them uh, with human compassion and being kind, you know, and, and sometimes, yes, sometimes you have to be a hard ass. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's unpleasant, but it doesn't, if you do your culture right, it doesn't have to be, right? There'll always be bad apples, there'll always be a few problems. But for the most part, if you can empathize with somebody, you're going to understand why they're thinking, you're probably going to get more out of them, or at least help them be happier at work and, and be more productive. So my, my only advice here is sit down with them, talk with them, have a cup of coffee with them. What's on your mind? Um, you know, what's going on with you? How are your kids? And it's always something you probably don't even think about, you know, uh, they've got a visa problem or one of their kids is sick or whatever else, but, but try to think empathetically and try to, to learn from that. So, 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 so summing up, uh, uh, and we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end. So if you want to ask something, I'm happy to answer it. If you have a, an idea, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, so the work from home thing is real. I mean, this, this is the one thing I never, nobody ever saw coming, but the years and years and years of doing this, okay, well, rounds are still kind of flat and the number of golf courses are slowly decreasing. And uh, we see a little bit more play from women and kids. Years and years of giving that speech to our business is going to permanently be 20% bigger than it was in 2019 <laughs> to, to, to at some level, right? <laughs> that, that we just moved up there. And that uh, that many of the things golf is doing to respond right now are very healthy. The remodeling and renovation boom drives a lot of, uh, of good stuff. Ultimately, super higher superintendent salaries do us a lot of good stuff. That means higher assistant salaries. That means hopefully better pay base in the future. So all that stuff that comes with some economic health and some profitability at clubs hopefully is trickling down to the maintenance department. I know it's not everywhere, but hopefully a little bit, right? So, but this work from home thing is real. And the, the, my buddy, Bill Weir, the lawyer, is just one, one of a million, 10 million, 20 million examples of that. People who would like to play but couldn't or who now have the time to play way more. And uh, so that, that's really good. Um, I, the other thing about this moment, right, that we're at. So we've gone through the pandemic and I made this point in a, in a talk I gave yesterday here at, at, at New Jersey. Superintendents were the heroes of pandemic, period. Don't, don't think any way otherwise. And it was in two ways. First, superintendents and turf associations in GCSA have always been the leaders in our industry, the golf industry, uh, in terms of lobbying and advocacy and getting going to Washington for National Golf Day. I've been to Washington National Golf Day a bunch of times, and it's always 80% golf course superintendents because you all care and you all want to be leaders and you all want to be viewed as responsible good citizens of your, your communities, your, your country. So uh, so I'm not saying that the general managers and golf pros aren't. I'm just saying they don't come to the meeting and you do. So that paid off big time. That that same thing that you've done in D.C. and in uh, and in, in uh, what's the capital of Virginia? Richmond? I can't remember. Shit. <laughs> I think it's Richmond. And all the things you've done in your state capitals to, to make tell those same stories. And, and to advance the interests of the golf industry and, and to make friends and, and with regul regulators and leaders, all that stuff paid off big time when the pandemic hit. And it wasn't perfect everywhere. And yeah, there were some states that were slow to come back and blah, blah, blah. But it was a big win most places. And it was because superintendents had laid the groundwork. And then when we got back to opening day or they, they, they allowed people to come back to work, superintendents were the only ones there. The first ones there, they went to work. And they kept those golf courses alive and they kept them economically healthy uh, and ready to go when, when play started. And when play started, boy, did it start. So uh, you all should be very proud and be, be very, uh, I think, uh, better recognized than you have been for being uh, the heroes that you were. And I, and I really do think in terms of golf, you were heroes. 
So, uh, and so now we're at this moment, this kind of special moment of what's going to happen next. And it's mostly good, but you have to be willing to change. You know, you have to be willing to figure out new ways to do things. And leaders do that. Leaders embrace change moments. There's times like this where it's like, okay, we're going to do it this way. This is, this is my, my, you start a new job and you say, I'm going to change this, this, and this, I'm going to do this. Or I really, I'm going to try to find a way to get more out of my employees by really getting to know who they are um, doing these things. Um, and, and so think about how you can change and think about what you can do to facilitate change in your facility that will be uh, positive for the future. Um, <laughs> I, I preach this all the time. You're only as good as your networking skills. That's one of the great things about this industry is we're all connected. We're all interconnected. And it's like, I, I meet people all the time. It's like, oh, you know, I never thought I'd get to meet you. Can I ask you a question? I'm like, I'm in the book, dude. So uh, same thing with Matt Schaefer. Same thing with, with uh, Dean Gray's. Same thing with, with people you know. You know the, the, every great superintendent is successful. Call them up. Hey, I'm getting ready to change jobs. What's your what's your uh, what are your three suggestions for me to to fit in when I get started? Hey, uh, you know, top superintendent, I, I I I'm interested in what I need to do to build my career uh, my my career portfolio to get a big time job. What would you recommend? Fine, build those relationships. When you come to a show like the the, the one of the state shows or national show or whatever, have an agenda. Have a set of people you want to meet with who can help you advance your career. Invest in yourself and invest that kind of time in yourself as much as you would in picking new greens mowers or whatever else. Meet people, get to know them, pick their brains, develop relationships with them. Um, it will all pay off. And this industry makes that so much better. And that's one of the things that's the best thing, a good thing about Twitter is those relationships that you get to build with people all over the world and then you meet them and it's joy. It's just great. I just had that happen yesterday with several people who have been uh, Twitter friends for years and I finally got to meet in person and it's really special. So um, I, I, I think uh, uh, figure out a way to build your, 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 your base of friends even bigger, okay? And last but not least, be empathetic. You know, think about how you can, uh, how you can walk a mile in somebody's shoes and understand who they are and what they do. So, so that's the end. Here's what's going to happen next. These two guys, this is trouble, right? So I think it said it was coming up, uh, uh, Eric, on January 8th. Is that right? Uh, I, I, I changed the slide a little bit. So that's coming up. So you can literally uh, do the little RFID code thing there where the dinosaur is, and that will tell you all about it. Uh, but that, of course, is Joel Simmons and Jack Higgins from Earthworks. Uh, who are going to absolutely mind mind numbingly long, dull, terrible story about soils? No, they're great. I, I've seen I've seen Joel's presentation on soils a hundred times, and I always watch it. It's so fascinating. So, Eric, when's this coming up? January twelfth. Twelfth. I was wrong. So that's January twelfth. Here is what you've all been waiting for. I know, and that's the magic code. Uh, uh, so you can write that down while, while I'm telling you about my granddaughters. So uh, the one on the right is Natalia. She's five. She's brilliant. She's hilarious. She's got some Ecuadorian blood in her. So every once in a while, she goes off on this riff in Spanish. It's hilarious. Uh, and then the little, the little turd there is uh, Isla, and she's about to turn two. And she is stinking adorable, and she lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So as you might imagine, my wife is always looking for reasons to go to Baton Rouge and visit. So uh, again, I highly recommend grandparenting. It, it really is something uh, that, that should happen earlier rather than later. But uh, now that I now that I'm in grandparenting land, I really really like it. So and then last but not least, there's my 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 uh, email address and my phone number. So if anybody wants to reach out, please feel free to, to uh, email me or text me or whatever, or send me a message on Twitter or one of them other platforms. And I'd be happy to chat with you because uh, I'm, I'm an old guy with time on my hands. So I'll be happy to help. So that's it, Eric. That's what I have. Awesome. Did anybody have any questions? Yeah, there's a couple online. I see John uh, Cummings uh, wanted to say hi, first of all, but also Hello, uh, asked the question is, uh, any idea what the average year of tenure, I would assume, at facilities are now for the average student? Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's gone up, right? So back when, when John and I were young pups and there was all sorts of churn because of all the new courses we were building, it was about eight or nine years. And now it's up 12, 12 years-ish. 
you know, between 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 11 and 13, 12, some, something like that. So again, this there, it's a myth that superintendents change jobs all the time or that they have no job security. And then Micah Davis asks, are turfgrass programs in need of courses that can host internships? No, <laughs> they're not, but, but it's up to you to get in line, right? So that was the whole point of this Penn State job fair and things like that. And, and uh, you need you need to reach out to whoever runs the two-year program. You know, if it's Penn State, it's Kaminsky. Uh, and, and, but reach out to those people and say, I really want to get involved. I would really like to have you bring some, some of your students out and do a tour at the golf course. I will show you around and all that stuff. But ultimately, I make it real clear. Ultimately, I would really like to have an intern from, intern from your program, right? So the, 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 you know, John Kaminsky, if you've been in this industry for 10 minutes, you know, John Kaminsky, he promotes the living daylights out of those kids and they all do well. Uh, but, but not all, I don't think all, uh, um, uh, university folks have that same that same self promotion skills. So reach out to them, I think, Micah, and, and, and do that. Um, you know, I, the the other thing that I think that they're interested in is people who can come talk or do a, a Zoom like this to their to their students. So that might be a way to get your foot in the door. For those on <clears throat> online listening, there's a question and answer uh, chat session down there. If you want to click and ask your question. Uh, to Pat, or certainly welcome to send them an email directly. But uh, we have a few minutes here. Uh, as I'm waiting for any more questions to come through, Pat, I, I want to say first and foremost, thank you. Uh, it was great seeing you uh, this yeah. week in New Jersey. Is also thankful that you had the time to to do this today for us and for those on in attendance. So uh, appreciate that. I also want to wish everybody on the call uh, happy holidays as we wrap up 2022. Uh, it's been a, a long year for some, and, uh, you know, I think that all of us should be looking forward to spending some time with family, friends, and uh, being thankful for, for the blessings we have in our life. So uh, I see Scott Malden said thank you. Uh, great to see you guy down there at uh, Bayville Golf Club. So thanks, Scott, for attending. Um, if there's any other questions, now's the time to ask. You can raise your hand or uh, use the question and answer function at the bottom mm -hmm. of your screen. Pat, anything, last comments? No, just, just that I, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough what a great time this is to go, uh, to go think about making a career change uh, and, and to take that seriously and to have a strategy for it and, and, and find something you love because the, there's so many courses that are, 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 are facing the challenge of replacing a veteran superintendent and they don't know how to do it. And so putting yourself out there as, as, as somebody who's ready to move up the ladder, I think is really, really important. Having a plan, right? Yep. 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 Don't just show up every day and take, take, you know, take a, take a long weekend or something like that and sit down put a yellow legal pad in front of you and put a line down the middle and say, here's what I love and here's what I hate. Right. <laughs> and try to minimize the stuff on the right side. The here's what I hate column. And, and, and figure out a way to, to make a change because there's a lot of demand for your skill set right now. Awesome. Yep. Make sure there's no last questions before we get off. Thank you for Mike Goatley from Virginia Tech. Mike, thanks for attending today. Jeff from Turf Men's on there. Awesome to see you on there. Also says thanks. Awesome. With that. Thank you guys again from Yes Conley, Landscape Supply, Ten Barge, Walker Supply. Uh, have a great rest of your year. Thank you for your time today. Uh, enjoy your holidays and uh, look forward to seeing you on our next one. It's a three hour webinar, uh, January 12th with Jack. Holy and Joel. shit. Three hours? He's going to talk about soils for three hours? Holy yeah. smokes. <laughs> All encompassing uh, webinar going on in it January. Is for sure. so. The other thing that will happen, right. we'll Thanks start. Everybody. See ya. And we're going to release our 2023 schedule uh, here in the coming weeks. Excited to have Tyler Bloom join us uh, next year uh, talking about workforce development. We'll have a mental health uh, work-life balance uh, session as well in May. And um, I think Dr. Kearns and Lee Butler from NC State are already lined up and secured for a, a presentation in March. So uh, looking forward to that schedule coming out here soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pat. You bet. See you soon.